generation after that. Uh, we've got responsibilities to the diversity of life on this planet. And that would be very true. We ought to change our ways because of that. That's very true. But with that, we would capture the 1%, um, a few more who have a well-developed moral sensibility. We would say, yes, I can see that that's important. <coughs> People who are advanced in Kohlberg's approach, for example. And for the majority of people, however, it may be entertained as an abstract ideal, but to turn it into action, which is where we need to go, it's no use just thinking about change. We've got to change the way we behave in the world. The realities of change within a democratic society are that we're going to need to make convincing arguments that it will be good for us. Not only will we avoid strife, but it will actually create a higher quality of life. And this is where realizing um, the delusions that we have been sold, because we have been sold delusions, and that those are false and we need to move beyond them um, is absolutely important. So I was saying yesterday that um, we have this sort of model where everything in terms of life satisfaction um, and happiness is deemed to be dependent upon having a trip through the marketplace where you need to pick up the things that will bring you um, social esteem, will bring you self-esteem and self-acceptance, and will bring you the quality of relationships, the meaning of life, that will ultimately define your satisfaction and happiness. And I was saying to you that this delusion um, can only really be counteracted by us realizing that there are direct routes to those major sources of satisfaction that don't involve the market. If we understand that, we save ourselves an inordinate amount of effort and stress, and particularly misplaced effort. Because if you want good relationships, you can forge good relationships. It's not dependent on what you have. It's dependent up upon who you are, not upon what you have. You build good relationships by being a solid friend by being reliable, by being trustworthy, by being generous, by being empathic. Those are the things that build rock-solid relationships. If you can't develop those things, then your option is to go to the market and find the things that are on a very superficial level might attract superficial people towards you. But they're not going to be rock-solid friends. It's not going to be very satisfying. And so we've got to realize that not only does a constant journey of life through the marketplace threaten sustainability and threaten social stability, because it certainly does in the long term, given the state of our resources, but it also undermines our fundamental well-being. And that's the importance of that stuff I was raising yesterday with Tim Kasser's work. Um, highly developed, systematic, empirical programs of research that show in terms of the fundamental needs we have as human beings that materialism undermines and challenges and weakens satisfaction in all of those basic realms. Our feelings of safety and security are undermined when we become highly materialistic. Our acceptance of ourselves, our sense of self-esteem, is threatened and undermined by materialistic attitudes, always wanting more, not feeling complete unless we have the next thing. Our relationships are undermined by excessive materialism. We can't be generous if we're attached to the material goods <coughs> we think define us. And in terms of finding freedom and autonomy, those who are highly materialistic feel less free less autonomous, and as a result, suffer in terms of their well-being and life satisfaction. But for many of us, <coughs> to see that is almost impossible. And it sort of reminds me in a sense of when we were talking about Kohlberg. And I was saying to you that if you think about sort of pre-conventional reasoning, all the way up to post-conventional reasoning, <coughs> that 
<clears throat> this movement upwards is one of realization. And that as you move from narrow-mindedness to broad-mindedness, only then do you realize the limitations of your previous state of consciousness. When you move beyond being wholly self-absorbed, you can realize the limitations of being wholly self-absorbed. When you're stuck in that condition, you can't. You just cannot see it. And similarly with happiness, for a lot of us who get um, caught up in materialist hankerings, I must have that thing. My happiness depends upon it. It can be compelling. We can actually think that things, material objects, will define our happiness for us. Um, in psychological terms, this is often discussed under um, the heading of impact bias. Rather ponderous term. But what it means is that people consistently overestimate how much satisfaction material goods will bring them and how long that will last. So people genuinely say to themselves, man, if I just had that iPad, my life would be so much better. And they think that. You have to think that to shell out the amount of money it takes to procure such things. But after a few months, the degree to which it has impacted your life is small. The original buzz has disappeared because it's just become another everyday object. The flash car that you think defines your coolness in the world may be flash, but you're still stuck in the same traffic jam maybe in the second year. And it's not actually doing that much for you. We're suckers for impact bias. The whole setup of our modern culture is designed, in a sense, to make us um, delusional and oblivious to this direct route here. If we decide that we have to grow economies, our ultimate goal is to grow GDP. We are all concerned about this. And what we need is people to move in there constantly, stay in there for as much of their lives as possible, and consume as much as they possibly can. And then our indicators of success <coughs> balloon. Okay. They seem great. Look, the economy is growing, everything's sweet. But we forget that this is a detour, it's kind of a bypass of the main highway towards satisfaction and happiness. And one of the reasons why I do the work I do in Bhutan, um, where they focus on gross national happiness <coughs> as opposed to gross domestic product or gross national product is because they cut to the chase. They say it's our effectiveness in moving along this highway that's important. These are the ultimate outcomes, not this. This is only a means to that end. And what we know increasingly is that this is not an effective means <clears throat> beyond the level of your basic needs. Once you've got those material needs satisfied, it's the immaterial things. A sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, good quality relationships, those are the things that build real happiness. Um, and we know that empirically. But I just wanted to um, point out one other aspect of this, or just to <coughs> reinforce it with um, that notion of freedom, for example. Because these are the kind of concepts that truly delude us. The idea that as we progress towards building a bigger and bigger economy, we become more free. And these ideas in our modern cultural framework, this framework that's reaching the end of its period of real utility, they're joined like that. The idea of market democracy and freedom and consumption and progress, those ideas are tied together in a very, very tight knot. And in our distracted and inattentive way of looking at the world around us, we miss the fact that what is going on is really akin to an Orwellian doublespeak. I don't know if you know that idea from 1984 of George Orwell's in terms of controlling societies. How do you control societies? What you do is you take things that have a particular purpose and agenda and you define them as their opposites. So a peacemaker miss missile, for instance. Or the recent American um, program, they have wonderful names for these campaigns, 
um, Operation Enduring Freedom. It's like, Enduring Freedom? Give me a break, eh? This is tying things down in long-term patterns of unfreedom, in perpetuity, and the, the reality of what that's about. But with this, we have a similar thing in terms of freedom. We grow our economies, we grow this idea of democracy in the marketplace, believing we become more free day by day. But we don't. And the reason we don't see that is because we're not paying attention to what's really going on. And let me give you an example. Um, when I was in your position in university in Scotland, and this used to be the case in New Zealand. I graduated from the university where I was studying with a fairly useless degree, a degree in social psychology, not something that employers are hanging out for. But I felt completely free to study that. I wasn't concerned that it was a dead-end pattern of study because it wasn't. At that time, if you had a degree, you could almost guarantee you were going to get a job at some point. Not an issue. So I graduated from university and did what many of my peers, in fact most of my direct peers did, which is take at least a year out of work, not going directly into work, and mainly because we were free of debts. We walked out of that institution funded by grants, competitive grants, I mean you have to get the qualifications to get the funding to get into university, but once you were there it was seen as being a social investment. And when you leave, you're absolutely debt free. So I walked out of my education not owing anybody a cent. And that allowed me and others to go, what do I want to do with my life before I have the formal obligations of work and family and all those types of things? So I could pick up my guitar, I could go around France and busk for a living for six months, I could go and pick grapes, I could go to Egypt. And I could, furthermore, when I get, get, went to Egypt, I've gone across the Sinai and get into um, <clears throat> Cairo about four o'clock in the morning, I could walk off the bus and feel perfectly free and safe. Okay. Not an issue of feeling, oh my God, this is a really dodgy, insecure situation, what am I gonna do? Okay. I could feel completely safe there. Meanwhile, my friends were doing <clears throat> things like the classic trip that people would do of heading um, overseas on the great trail that would go through Iraq, and go through Iran, and go through Afghanistan. Perfectly free, never been hassled, no problem at all. People can smoke hash in Kabul and feel perfectly at home. And nowadays you can't do that. You're not free to do that. The world has changed. For a start off, you're indebted. When you leave, most of you, which is a huge burden. It's a hand on your throat. It's a sort of mortgage of your life. In terms of parts of the world that you can be free to go to, you are much less free than we were right? at your age to explore the world. The world is not a more free place in terms of your choices. Um, I was free to pick and choose in terms of employment. I could take a year out and I knew I'd be able to find a job. The way your economy has been mismanaged, now your freedom to take time away from work or out of work or take a break from work is severely constrained. You can't, in a competitive job market, just go out oh, bugger for two years, and then I'll come back and pick up where I left off. You can't do that anymore. You are less free. And it's a discernible pattern and progression. You think about how financial markets have been liberated. If you want to buy a house now, compared with 10 years ago, compared with 20 years, the liberty that's been given to the markets and to banks to create debt that you have to take on if you are going to own a house has multiplied extraordinarily in recent decades. And that ties you down. If you want to get a good house in a decent suburb in Auckland, you're going to have to work so damn hard you're not going to have much time to spend in your nice house you'll have to work. It's not more freedom. It's more unfreedom. It's more constraint. And yet we blithely believe that as long as there's more stuff in the market that we can pick and choose from, then we're becoming more free. 
but it's delusional in the large context. And what it really means is that our lives are defined more and more <coughs> within this framework. And as long as there's freedom within this framework, freedom to buy newer, flasher, more complex, <coughs> more updated goods, we feel as if we are genuinely free. But when you lift your eyes from that marketplace, to look at the broader picture, we're not free at all. It's very, very difficult to exercise your freedom, particularly in a debt-ridden society. It's, it's deeper and deeper in terms of the difficulties involved. Um, so important, I think, to understand where those fundamental delusions begin. And essential to understand how we can work to change them because it's your challenge as a generation is to begin to change that stuff. But it's not simple at all. And in fact, part of the problem with freedom, when you think about it discerningly, and you think about it critically, it's kind of encapsulated in this um, email, it's very well put, um, in that sense of going, well, this just feels futile. Eh? What can I actually do? How do we go about changing things? Because for many of us, I think, once we begin to appreciate the gravity and the interconnected nature of the problems we face, we feel it's very, very difficult indeed to begin to broach those problems and begin to challenge them. And it's then that some essential aspects of our freedom come into relief. We are free, defined within the marketplace, to consume according to our income or our willingness to take on debt obligations. But, as soon as you step out of that framework and you go, actually, I don't agree with this. I do not agree with this in principle. I do not agree with it in practice. This current system, as I look towards the future, is disastrous. And I don't want to go along with it. I want to change it. At that point, you find that the individualism that we have stuck notions of freedom to, ever since sort of Adam Smith's notions of expanding the market through selfishness and self-interest, we live in an individualized age. It's meant to be empowering because you don't have obligations to anyone or anything else unless you choose to. And that's freedom. <clears throat> but if you choose, to have obligations and to live responsibly, you find just how disempowering individualism is. It's all fine and well while you're walking with the herd in that direction. <clears throat> For individual freedoms, fine, you can elbow people out of the way, you can move ahead of the crowd, you can be the rugged individual. But as soon as you turn around and go, actually I want to go in that direction, you find that individualism is disempowering, not empowering at all, because suddenly you are isolated. Suddenly you are on your own. Some, suddenly you are the, the, the sort of freak rogue element in society. Right? And that is fundamentally disempowering. Unless you can find a solid ground within yourself, that makes you somewhat immune to the herd-like mentality of others. Where you can go, actually, I'm walking in this direction and I'm bumping into people all the time, but I don't mind. And I can say to all those people, mate, you're going the wrong direction. Boy, you're going the wrong direction. And you should turn around and hey, walk this way. It's much more fun. But that's hard for people to do and it requires an individual strength to exercise that freedom that is radically different from what the market tries to get you to buy, and I mean buy psychologically. That you've got to fit in, that you've got to be like everybody else, that you've got to wear the latest fashions, that you've got to ultimately just be with everybody else in the marketplace. If you want to challenge that, it becomes difficult, and it's then that our freedom to really move um, can be seen for the constrained state that it actually is. But, having said that, <clears throat> the way that we can find genuine satisfaction in the midst of all of this is to deny moving in there as the meaning of life and to resist <clears throat> the excesses of the materialism which is drilled into us on a daily basis. 
in all the ads that we see, in the way that people internalize that and pressure us to conform to those types of things. And the magic about all this <coughs> stuff on um, happiness and on materialism lies in its popping, its joyful popping of that particular bubble in terms of saying, look, you actually don't need all that. You don't need the gargantuan amount of debt you're encouraged to take on to be happy. You don't need all that stress of keeping up with everything as the latest thing to find satisfaction in life. You don't need to be working all the time to find satisfaction in life. In fact, you'll find more satisfaction if you slow down and work less and consume less and put your energies into the immaterial sources of genuine satisfaction, of spending time with friends, of doing constructive things, and of finding those non-material pursuits in life that really do consolidate your happiness and well-being. And that, if we can get there, is a fabulous way forward. And <clears throat> just to um, make a final connection back to this social um, media stuff that I said out, would mention um, <clears throat> this sort of direct connection between yourself and your satisfaction and happiness and the interests of others and the sort of outcomes that we identified at the beginning of this course and what your essays were about um, <clears throat> in terms of helping others live in a more inclusive world for instance <clears throat> there are fabulous ways and fabulous organizations popping up right now using creative technologies to address problems in non-regular market-based ways. Let me just give you a, one example, um, but it's a really good one to check out online. Um, there's an organization called Kiva um, that you may or may not have come across, but Kiva is um, an online system of microcredit. Remember when we were talking about the IMF and the World Bank and the way those institutions entrap countries and populations in debt? Once they're in debt, they then move in primarily through the IMF to radically restructure economies so we can grab their resources and give them the breadcrumbs. That strategy that's now been applied to Greece so that it moves closer to home. <clears throat> that is a process of forcing markets upon countries. That's what it's all about. It's about taking a market ideology and going, you too will come through the marketplace for everything. And you will allow us to more effectively and thoroughly expand our own marketplace so we live in there even more um, thoroughly. What Kiva does is it goes, well, that's a ridiculous model. Um, what we know is that microcredit works. We know from instances like the Grameen Bank that if you put small money in at the grassroots level, people deal with it responsibly and they are empowered. So you give it to women and those women will decide what is best for their families and their communities, they'll develop enterprises, they'll pay back the loans at 98% repayment levels, which any Western commercial bank would fall over um, it would surprise if they had that on their own books. What Kiva does is it goes, well, let's build on that concept and let's just network people. So we will put on our website, you can go there, um, a whole bunch of people from around the world who've got projects that are good projects in need of money. And you, as somebody who signs on to Kiva, can give them some money, give them directly. There's nothing involved apart from some folks on the ground monitoring <coughs> the quality of these projects to make sure the money isn't wasted. After six months or a year, depending upon how you set it up, that money will come back to you, no interest, because if you're getting interest, you're exploiting somebody. It's a hand up, it's genuine aid. So give them that money, promise 50 bucks, for example, for six months or a year, that 50 bucks will come back to you. You can then reinvest that in somebody else and give them a hand up as well. But what it does is it allows people like you We'd be in a situation of going, God, all these problems in the world, it's all futile and there's no way of dealing with it. To actually go in an afternoon like this afternoon and give somebody a hand up. You can do it. It's all clearly regulated and um, moderated as a process. And a great instance of how we can move away from some of that full freedom 
um, and selfishness of the market to engage alternative helpful strategies through the very clever use of social media. Um, and, but underneath all of this is this um, hope that if only we can crack the stupidity of our own delusions, which is created for us, and again, marketing is a mammoth problem in the middle of all of this, um, if we can break and snap out of that, we probably can exercise the maturity to sort a lot of the fundamental challenges that we've got. But as long as we remain in that delusion of thinking that all good things and all meaning in life and satisfaction comes from the market, then it will be business as usual and we all know where that's heading to. Okay, that's enough for me and my soapbox.